Hi, I'm Heidi Otway, your host for this Conversations on Cannabis virtual forum, brought to you by the Medical Marijuana Education and Research Initiative at Florida A&M University. In this conversation, we're talking about the benefits and the risks of using cannabis for self-care. Let's meet the guests for today's show. Dr. Alicia Rowley is a mental health clinician with 15 years of experience, and she specializes in depression and anxiety. Dr. Rowley, welcome to the show. Tell us more about yourself. Hi, Heidi. It's great to see you again, and thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is Dr. Alicia Rowley. I'm an associate professor uh, in counselor education at Florida a and University. I'm entering my 10th year of teaching on the collegiate level and uh, just enjoying it more and more every day. Um, as you said, I've also been a clinician um, in clinical mental health counseling for over 15 years, and I'm just happy to be here and to share some knowledge. Great, well, we're happy to have you. Dr. Gwen Singleton is a researcher and professor who directs the Center for Ethnic Psychological Research and Application at Florida a and University. Dr. Singleton, welcome to the show. Tell us, more, tell us more about your experience. Hello, Heidi. Thank you also for having me. It's my pleasure to join you all in this uh, wonderful panel and this topic. I am a professor of psychology at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University as well. And uh, with my 20th year at FAMU, um, I've had the pleasure of serving as a director for the Center for Ethnic Psychological Research and Application, as, as Heidi has said. And um, we um, pride ourselves in bringing psychoeducational programming to our community to our campus, as well as conducting research um, to inform those programs. So thank you for having me. Well, Dr. Singleton, thank you. I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about the research that you do on the subject. Dr. Janester mm -hmm. Wilson King is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist who is also one of the nearly 3,000 physicians in Florida that are qualified to recommend medical cannabis to patients. Dr. Wilson King, it's so good to have you back on the program. Mm -hmm. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you so much, Heidi. And it is a pleasure to be here again and to be with this distinguished panel. I'm so excited and I'm really looking forward to uh, the outcome of this program. I, I believe the audience is going to get some really good information. Uh, as you said, I am a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist. I've been in practice for Ooh, a number of years. And uh, I, for the past 10 years, my practice has transitioned to more of an integrative wellness practice such that I assess where people are on the health and wellness spectrum and then help them get to where they want to be through nutrition and lifestyle behavior modification, uh, how to take supplements uh, and, and uh, hormone balancing and cannabis uh, recommendations. If my motto is, if you are a hormonally balanced woman who uses cannabis, you are a brand new woman ready to take on the world. Ooh, okay, we're gonna talk about that. So, thank you all for being our guest today. To everyone who's joining us on this live forum, please share, post, and tag a friend on Facebook to have them join this conversation. If you're on YouTube, share the links so others can join as well. During the forum, we want you to send us your questions in the comment box, and we'll do our best to have our guests answer them for you. We also want you to tell us what you think about this forum by completing the survey that will be posted in the comments comments on YouTube and Facebook after this live program. Your name will be entered into a drawing on January 6th, 2022 to win a $100 gift card provided by one of Mary's partners. So let's dive into our conversation about cannabis and self-care. And Dr. Rowley, I'm going to start with you. Can you give our listeners and viewers a definition of self-care? Well, uh, it's quite an expansive topic that has become increasingly um, a point of discussion, especially in social media. And I think that uh, oftentimes we frame self-care in the form of an act, uh, going to get my nails done, getting my hair done, relaxing. And those are all great things to do to um, implement some self-care in your life. But essentially, self-care is more of a conscientious decision to prioritize yourself. 
Um, and mental health, I find so often that the issues that are happening are um, deeply ingrained in our normalized dysfunctions. So many times we are not dealing with the things that are deeper, the things that are really uh, the foundation of a lot of the stress that we feel on the surface. So um, I, I always have this uh, motto for my clients, the one, two, three, what the heck is bothering me question um, to kind of get ourselves to a place where we're starting to ask some deeper questions and then the work begins. And that is oftentimes where um, we don't associate that the work with uh, self-care. Uh, we do the more temporary things, but don't uh, focus on uh, the long-term effects of doing the work in, in your personal life. Yeah. So Dr. Singleton, what are the benefits of self-care? Yes, Heidi. Wow. There, there are tremendous uh, benefits of self-care. And typically we uh, don't pay attention to the value. We just feel we're just doing it just because it's the popular thing to do. Um, but there are significant benefits associated with self-care. Research has shown that it decreases blood pressure. Um, it helps us to manage stress. So it decreases our um, anxiety and stress responses in challenging situations. Um, it also, so I didn't say I'm a neuropsychologist. So from, from the brain standpoint, it helps to change the way our brains function. So the stress response is reduced. The uh, release of stress hormones has been reduced. Um, our heart rate reduces. So, so many other things that have the potential for um, physical impact. So it can improve our cognitive um, processing along with how well we sleep. Um, our thinking, our relationships, because we're calmer, we're positive, we're more happy. Um, so it helps to balance so many aspects of our lives. So I strongly urge everyone, if you're not engaging in it intentionally, as Dr. Rowley says, identify some intentional practices to engage in starting today. Well, I have to confess that Dr. Rowley, you just messed me up because my brain, self-care for me was going to get my nails done, going to the spa, and literally I have been planning all week, okay, I'm going to do some self-care. I'm going to book that appointment and I'm going to get a CBD foot scrub and all this other kind of stuff. So you just messed me up. And now I really need to focus on prioritizing myself. And that brings me to Dr. Wilson King. So Dr. Wilson King. Yes. Tell us, how can we start our own self-care routine and a self-care plan where we are truly prioritizing ourselves in, in, in different ways? Sure. Let me just touch on one other thing. Self-care, I, I totally agree with the rest of this panel. It is, it, everything they said is totally correct. I love the, the being intentional about it. We I, actually, my last newsletter was about intentional or mindful eating, mm -hmm. and we if we practice mindfulness and intention, have a, an intention before we're doing anything, you'd be surprised at how smoothly and proficient mm -hmm. you become, and how less stress and drama is created due mm -hmm. to that. So I want to just definitely emphasize that self care also helps you one to enhance your own endocannabinoid system, which is important, mm -hmm. not just for cannabis, it's important overall. It is the mm -hmm. fundamental homeostatic regulator of the uh, human, all human mm -hmm. physiology. Mm -hmm. It's, there isn't an aspect of our, how our bodies work that uh, isn't influenced by this system. So there are more CB1 receptors. Now that's a part of the endocannabinoid system, but there's more of those receptors in the brain than there are for all other neurotransmitters combined. Wow. So it's a real important system and it helps us sleep, eat, relax, protect, forget, and it provides balance. Now, how can we start a self-care plan? We are a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. And you must nourish and nurture all three in order to be well. And it's a daily practice. Health is not just the absence of disease, disease, but wellness is a, well, health is the absence of disease, but wellness is a balanced life. So the foundation of health is eating real food, drinking clean water, and breathing fresh air. That's the best place to start. 
Now, to be a little more specific, when I say real food, I mean food that you can go outside and pick from the tree or pull from the ground. When you go to the store, you don't want to, when you buy, say, spinach, you want the ingredients list to say spinach, <laughs> not just five other things that, number one, you can hardly pronounce, and number two, you don't even know what they are. So you know they're not food. So you want to eat real food, shop the perimeter of the store, read the labels, things like that. Exercise, hugely important. An unhealthy body mm -hmm. is an energy drain. Mm -hmm. And I know sometimes the word exercise has negative connotations for some people, but it doesn't mean that's less important. Right. So the um, uh, find something that you like to do and do that. You don't if you don't have to go to a gym. You don't have to buy expensive equipment. Just go outside your front door and or back door and walk for 15 minutes. Turn around and walk back and do that every day. That is appropriate mm -hmm. exercise and it's easy to do. If you like to dance, put on a YouTube video or and and dance for 30 minutes. It's yeah. easy to do. Yoga is great. There's even chair yoga. <laughs> so there's all sorts of things that we can do for exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and just to let you know, there was a group of scientists that uh, at the University of Nottingham who tested 78 people. They took half of them and had them exercise for 15 minutes a day for six weeks and the other half did not exercise at all. Mm -hmm. And at the and they did measurements, uh, measured certain levels of, of substances in the body. And at the end of six weeks, those who exercised increased the levels of anti-inflammatory substances in their body, meaning substances mm -hmm. that fight inflammation, and it decreased the levels that create inflammation, and it mm -hmm. increased the levels of endocannabinoids in the system. And that's just with 15 minutes of exercise a day for six weeks. So that's huge. Yeah. And the, fi the final aspect is nurturing your spirit. That meditation, prayer, having five minutes of silence, like that you just don't think about anything, quiet your mind. Ooh, that sounds so hard. Things like that. It is hard, <laughs> but if you start off doing it for 60 seconds. Right, right. Got say, you. you know, everybody has little timers on their phones, so 60 yeah. seconds, and just don't think about anything. What, what you do is just, it, it is hard to try not to think about anything. So what you do is you focus your mind on breathing and like pretend that you're observing your breath go in and out and that takes your mind off of thinking and it's really it's effective you'd be amazed at what that does to you so those are the places to start and then the next step would be sleep but i'll stop there because i know i'm on a panel yeah, and this is dr. not a monologue yeah. let's have dr roley dr roley self-care plans some tips for our listeners and viewers here well, I love uh, what Dr. Wilson King was saying um, because it absolutely, um, you know, there's an impact of the mind-body connection and wellness, um, yes. you know, in 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 everyone. Um, now, one of the things that is very interesting is my clients often have problems with mindfulness and they have issues mm -hmm. with um, meditation because of some of the things that are going on on the inside. They don't want to get quiet because if they get quiet, then they hear the loud mm -hmm. noise on the inside um, mm -hmm. that is not being. Uh, you know, that that's not been addressed. And so from a clinical mental health perspective, we really encourage self-care uh, in doing the work by seeing someone, talking to someone, getting some of that toxicity out of your system. Mm -hmm. uh, because so, you know, I mentioned normalized dysfunction and where that comes from, especially, you know, when you, you know, right now we've gone through a very, very difficult time. Um, with um you know covid and now people are really anxious to uh, be around family and friends more and um you know systems generational systems of how we deal with our stress how we deal with trauma um they really really do impact uh, some of our mental health disturbances so i can't say how important it is to uh, engage or 
add to a part of your self-care plan um, to see a therapist. I think that's absolutely important, uh, an important part of a, of a self-care plan. And if you think about it, I have to say there are so many options for getting mental health um, care. So many people think that it is um, not attainable because of finances. But just think about this metaphor. If we um, have an issue with a tire, and we go to the tire place, there's no question that we will pay whatever it costs to get that right. tire fixed because you know, our car is a priority. But it just baffles me how we don't understand that if there is no us, if our brains and our bodies and our minds are not working correctly, then nothing else really matters. So I think that that has to absolutely be a part of any person's self-care plan. Mm -hmm. yes. Dr. Singleton, I'll have you wrap up that whole question about self-care. Any tips for our listeners and viewers? Definitely. Um, so I'm also a meditation instructor. And so just some of the things we identified, uh, challenges with, with meditating. Um, I have a segment called Quiet the Noise. So, so often there's so much noise outside of us, but also inside of us. And um, just taking a moment just to quiet the noise, just like Dr. Wilson King suggested, even if you start with 60 seconds mm -hmm. um, and then um, extend. So just keep increasing that um, so that then you will really uh, benefit from that moment of, mm -hmm. of investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, because once you quiet the noise, um, then it helps to, again, allow you to focus. The same is so with exercise. So I have to talk about research too. Dr. Wilson King mentioned research on exercise. So there's also additional research that talks about um, exercising individuals um, cells are younger. So when they actually um, analyze them at the cellular level, their cells are younger, they live longer. Mm -hmm. And so definitely take advantage of, you know, your mental health care professionals, as well as your physicians and other resources to identify um, a self-care assessment. There are some, some tools online as well. A number of the things that Dr. Rowley and Dr. Wilson King mentioned, um, the eating diet, you know, um, clearing your mind, meditation, all those things uh, as part of a self-care assessment to allow you to determine where you are right now with your self-care mm -hmm. and then to guide you in the development of your own customized self-care plan. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great idea. So, so Dr. Singleton, you talked about the self-assessment, but let's take, a, let's take it to another level. You know, what are some of the warning signs that someone mm -hmm. may need to take the assessment or that they may be experiencing some kind of mental health, you know, issue, feelings, things like that. So Dr. Rowley, in your mm -hmm. role um, as a clinician, what are some of the warning signs? So it's interesting. So as I was listening to Dr. Singleton and Dr. Wolf, uh, Wilson King, I was just thinking about how the weight becomes the weight sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So that internal weight can 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 really lead to those medical issues or issues with, um, you know, with being unhealthy um, holistically. And so, um, you know, I really think that. It's important to tune into yourself and to look at your routine and the things that are off. So I could speak clinically, but I, I want our listeners to really understand to um, what you should really, really look out for. So if you are increasing, uh, you are, you're finding that you are more uh, irritable uh, than usual, that you don't en enjoy engaging in. For example, the activities normally that you would uh, find enjoyable for, you know, the, the exercise, the walking, um, you know, sometimes people disengage and they don't even realize that they disengage from, um, you know, it, with family and friends and, you know, uh, interacting with others and being able to take a walk and um, also unhealthy eating habits. And an unhealthy lifestyle is often a coping mechanism for depression and for anxiety. Uh, sleeping issues are often associated with issues related to anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have to, again, look at the adjustment that has happened over the past two years. Um, I think that most people have done the best they can with adjusting to um, you know, the, the critical changes uh, for those who are parents. Um, there is caregiver fatigue, fatigue, there's compassion fatigue, there is, you know, all kinds of fatigues, um, you, know, uh, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to work, how you're going to, you know, all of a sudden we went from having 
one role or defined roles to now this what we call intersectional um, identities where we are not just um, you know moms at five o'clock but we are now professor mom wife cook all these things right, because we're right. working from home so yeah. all those things that are happening or that we had to adjust to um really i think many people got clouded and it, it just things got got cluttered and it was difficult to see to see what um where the balance was off so i think that that is a really big indicator um you know that something something may be uh, an emotional disturbance maybe on the rise or um already very apparent in your life so Dr. Rowley, you touched on the the intersectional intersectional tell me the term again intersectional oh, intersectional identity identity yeah. right and mm -hmm. and you and you reference you said I'm a woman I'm a mom I'm this what about for men so some of the guys mm -hmm. that are listening here what what are the impacts to them what what do they need to know when it comes to self care is self care for men too oh gosh yes and and you know Heidi, I really appreciate that question because intersectional identities describe the the fact that we cannot be seen aside from all these different things that make up who we are, right? right. So we're talking about um, you know structures of oppression in society, issues that are happening because of uh, the you know your sexuality or how you identify. All these things impact who we are. So it's just mm -hmm. as uh, relevant to a man as it, as it is to a woman. Um, I think that uh, more we need to have more conversations about men and self care because um, you know men deal with anxiety, depression issues. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they're you know more likely to have have emotional disturbances that are not treated than women are. So I think that we have to have more conversations about men and make it socially acceptable to have conversations and to seek treatment for um, mental health disturbances. Dr. Singleton, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, definitely. I, I so agree with Dr. Rowley and um, truly believe that our men are often neglected. Uh, we don't pay adequate attention to um, the, the challenges, the emotional concerns um, for men um, and having the patience um, to hear their voices um, or to assist them in allowing to find their voices because often men are um, encouraged um, to suppress what they're feeling. Um, you know, the, the worst thing I've heard is be a man, you know, when something hurts, you know, right. so, I mean, being a man means to ad admit that it hurts and then to mm -hmm. work for resolving whatever yeah. um, is causing the hurt. So we do need to spend more time listening to our men as, and then starting with our young men and, and, and making it um, acceptable and normalizing um, the acceptance, acknowledgement, and expression of mm -hmm. e emotions without judgment, without right. um, any criticisms um, or anything to make them feel that they are less of a man. I mm -hmm. feel so passionate about, you know, uh, that, that we really need to work toward that. We need to support mm -hmm. our men lift them up because we're all in this community together this is part right. of the, you know our family yes. um so if one part of the family is not well then the rest of the part of the family mm -hmm. is not well so we yes. need to embrace our entire family and um help our men as well yeah. as the women in our community yes. Thank you. Can, I, can, I add, can I add one thing to that? Actually, yeah, because I I, I just want to I, I just I just want to echo and agree with everything you just said, Dr. Singleton. Um, oftentimes, men are associated with strength, and really, strength is about having the courage to face yourself, to face yeah. the issues that are causing those disturbances internally. And I just love the idea of um, of encouraging strength through mm -hmm. a focus on caring for self um, and prioritizing self mm -hmm. in, in the entire family. So I just wanted to appreciate what you were saying, Dr. Sanderson. Yeah, definitely. And, and Dr. Being, Dr. being human yeah. means I'm sorry. No, I, I wanted you to talk about that. And, and I also want you to also, Dr. Wilson King, talk about it from how women can support men in this. Mm -hmm. in the oh, absolutely. Yeah, so he touched we, on, yeah. Men and women are human. The more human you are, the more of a man and a woman you are. Right. So we are all subjected to the human experience. And that involves emotions, laughing, 
crying, feeling sad, feeling happy, feeling joy. It involves being there for each other. Uh, not all men like to talk. Not all women like to talk. Mm -hmm. You have been with your spouse, your partner, uh, and you, you'll know the personalities. If this is not a talker, maybe you have to give them space until they're ready to talk. Yeah. So don't force the issue. Mm -hmm. If some people won't talk unless you ask the proper questions. So mm -hmm. learn what those proper questions are when you're ready. And certainly don't talk about things when you're angry because then you're not talking, you're just spewing anger. So wait till everybody's calm and then have a conversation. But the time to have a conversation is not at bedtime. <laughs> at least you don't want to do things to disrupt sleep. And, and you certainly, this is a mixed audience, but you certainly don't want to use intimacy as a tool for talking or for doing anything together. That should remain separate. So you, you, you separate those two things. So those are, those are some of the things that women can do and men can do. We can do for each other mm -hmm. is just know our, our, our personality, know how we like to do things and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. Don't force it. Don't yeah. force it. We have to allow people to experience feeling, allow people to, to, to go through their emotions and get to a point where they are ready to talk. And then you talk. One of the other things I can suggest is uh, for men and women to uh, journal. Now, it doesn't mean you have to get a book and start writing things. You can do pull up a doc word document on your computer and just start writing things out the stuff that's the things that are on your mind just type them and then you can hit delete at the end and it's mm -hmm. gone but at right. least you've gotten out gotten it out of your system and that really can help relieve some of the stress and help maybe decrease some of the intensity so that you can maybe relax and 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 proceed with life Okay, so we've kind of set the stage here where we've identified what self-care is, the benefits of self-care, some of the uh, mental health warning signs that people could look out for, how to communicate better, you know, if you're having these issues. Now I want to insert the conversation about cannabis into mm -hmm. self-care. And mm -hmm. Dr. Wilson King, you're one of the nearly 3,000 physicians in the state of Florida that are qualified to recommend cannabis to people legally. So tell us about the role of cannabis and what it, how it can be involved in self-care. And I'm just gonna say that I have been reading a lot of articles lately about from mainstream media talking about cannabis and self-care. So it is being discussed. So Dr. Luther King, share with us how cannabis uh, and is being used in self-care. Sure, absolutely. There are many of the self-care um, practices that, that cannabis can help with. One of the main uh, things, uh, one of the main reasons to use cannabis is for sleep. There's a lot of people that can't sleep. Um, it's, it's, Unlike and unlike sedative and sleep meds, cannabis, when used in proper low doses, works for that the dose that works for that individual. It's a very effective sleep medicine. The important thing about sleep is that there's non-REM sleep and there's REM sleep. All of the stages are important, but your body really heals and repairs and rejuvenates during REM sleep. And oftentimes sleep medicines will not get you into REM sleep. They just zonk you out. Cannabis does not disrupt the sleep architecture. That's what we call non-REM and REM sleep. If used properly, now you can use more a uh, higher dose than you need to, and that will disrupt the sleep architecture. So when I say cannabis is very effective and won't disrupt the sleep architecture. That means if you're using a low dose that works for that individual. Now a dose for me, low dose to me can be a, an entirely different dose for someone else. Right. Five milligrams might be low for me. 20 milligrams might be low for another person. So it depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. Then another uh, self-care, uh, 
you can't have a quality life or, or practice self-care if you're in pain. So cannabis is very effective, mm -hmm. very effective for pain relief. Right. Uh, one thing I want to remind people about cannabis is that it is what we call biphasic, meaning low doses work one way, high doses work the other way. High doses can actually do the opposite. Let's take anxiety, for example. Cannabis is very helpful for anxiety. In fact, 90% uh, of the people that use cannabis for anxiety get relief. But low doses help anxiety. High doses create or induce anxiety. Wow. So you have to be careful in areas such as that. So uh, there's sleep, there's pain, there's anxiety, uh, there's depression. Cannabis is very helpful for depression. And one of the areas that in which cannabis is really helpful, especially in the realm of anxiety and depression, is oftentimes people are on different medications maybe four, five, six medications for their depression, for their anxiety, for sleep, for ex If you use cannabis, cannabis is effective in getting people off of a lot of those medications. Yeah. It's really, really helpful so that you can live a quality life and your life doesn't revolve around taking medications throughout the day. Yeah. So Dr. Rowley, talk about um, in your practice, are you having patients come to ask you, should I consider cannabis use as part of my self-care? Yes. So, um, you know, interestingly, interestingly enough, um, you know, physicians uh, and clinical mental health counselors work in concert together for the sake of our, uh, we call them clients and physicians may call them patients. Yeah. Um, but what we are, are partners in figuring out uh, the best uh, road of treatment or intervention for mm -hmm. each individual client. Like Dr. Wilson King um, mentioned, it's not a one size fits all for anyone. Right. Um, in a clinical mental health setting, I primarily hear about clients interested in the use of cannabis uh, who are dealing with chronic pain, with PTSD, with anxiety um, and um, but social anxiety, especially. Mm -hmm. And so while I don't have the authority to prescribe medication um, of any kind uh, or to um, provide a medical marijuana card, one of the things that I say is that, you know, nothing is a magic pill. Uh, no cannabis, no, uh, you know, medication, no nothing is a magic pill for doing the work. So uh, for any of my clients, I always suggest um, a continuation of, uh, you know, counseling, uh, even if cannabis is prescribed um, or is the uh, modality for intervention. So. Mm -hmm. You know, and let me add to that, because one of the most important factors with using cannabis for the treatment of anxiety or depression or however you're using it is that it helps patients be open and more receptive to behavior therapy. Absolutely. And you, we really should not leave out behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. I agree with you totally. Pills mm -hmm. and substances do not always provide the entire solution. Mm -hmm. In fact, when patients use cannabis in addition to their meds, 72% of them will decrease or discontinue their use of benzodiazepines and other anti-anxiety pills. 77% stop their opi or decrease their opioid use, and 38% of them will reduce their use of antidepressants. When it's done in combination with behavior therapy, those numbers are even higher. Yeah. So behavior therapy is definitely important. And what I have found is that the older generation, I guess you call them the boomers now, uh, <laughs> are so used to pills. Yeah. The younger generation don't necessarily want to take all those pills, but they're not necessarily open to behavior therapy mm -hmm. right at that moment. So. Mm -hmm. If we just combine all of that and try to encourage people to be open and honest and receptive to all the different modalities, mm -hmm. they can really find an individualized, customized plan mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. helps them. Yeah. Utilizing yeah. some of those different pieces. So mm -hmm. that's kudos. Good. Yes. That's good. Dr. Singleton, let's talk about the risk of using cannabis 
for self-care? Uh, definitely. Um, so um, as with any substance, um, whether it's prescribed medication, um, alcohol, or you know any other uh, substances that we enter in our body, there's a risk for potential side effects. Um, and so, of course, um, it's so critical that um, individuals work closely with their physicians, um, as Dr. Wilkinson has identified, because the doses, dosing will be different from individual to individual because we have individual differences within families, within siblings, within identical twins, because our neurochemistry is different, our, the way our brains respond. Uh, mm -hmm. to uh, substances will vary. So mm -hmm. just, just some of the side effects, increased blood pressure um, uh, or decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate. So then of course that could be problematic for individuals with pre-existing uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, some researchers identify problems with uh, problem solving, uh, just thinking in general, uh, social issues. Dr. Wilson King mentioned increased anxiety as one of the, the side effects. Um, and then, of course, along with it, um, as with other substances, come uh, withdrawal symptoms. So, um, so the, the use of medical cannabis or recreational um, could increase anxiety, agitation, um, increase vital signs. So, again, indicating that there are some problems. Um, mm -hmm. So, there could be um, drug interactions. So, um, uh, using mm -hmm. cannabis with alcohol can um, increase the, the effect of uh, sedation. So of course that could be problematic for driving and engaging in other activities because it increases the likelihood of um, accidents. And then there's an increase also for cannabis use disorders. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Rowley and Dr. Wilson King were describing the um, importance of combining uh, behavioral therapy along with um, pharmaceuticals, um, specifically medical cannabis, um, it's important because that decreases the likelihood of cannabis use disorders. So mm -hmm. for instance, individuals using um, um, cannabis for anxiety, um, and, and again, if they adjust the dose um, in a way that the physician has not advised, that could be problematic, but then it also can cause a rebound where it reduces the um, anxiety, but then um, when, the, uh, when it starts wearing off, then the anxiety increases. So then it's this vicious cycle of increased usage. Um, and of course, problems with that, again, um, that it could increase sensitization to cannabis. So mm -hmm. then it can cause some additional side effects where, um, as Dr. Wilson King was talking about, a low dose may be the appropriate dose for you, but because of sensitization, it increases the body's reaction to it, and then they get some of the negative effects. Mm -hmm. And so with um, cannabis use disorders, then the person is more likely to use um, higher doses, and then they're more likely to suffer long-term memory problems, long-term cognitive mm -hmm. processing, problem-solving, impulse um, issues. Uh, so it's just so many things that go on. And there is research that also suggests while there's no um, concrete evidence that it causes brain damage or of um, serious issues in that way, but it, there is some indication that white matter, um, which is in the brain, helps improve your cognitive function, speed, and smoothness of uh, thinking, movement, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so there could be some problems. And this is specifically, um, with the research right now, more recreational, um, okay. not medical cannabis. But right. still, again, medical cannabis can have um, some negative side effects, if not followed um, by you know, the recommendations by, that provided mm -hmm. by the physician. So yeah. again, it's so critical that you um, work with your physician and your mental health professionals to ensure that you're following their recommendations to um, avoid these negative side effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and can I add a, a few things yeah, there? Please. Um, thank you for bringing those things up, Dr. Singleton. Uh, certainly you are correct in that as far as cannabis use disorder, which I'm not sure is really a real disorder, it really affects the uh, adult use or recreational users who use the high percentage THC. And that's usually the younger male age group, uh, 20s and, that, and whatnot. But medical cannabis does not have that problem. Also in reference to driving, 
Cannabis slows the reaction time and will impair short-term memory. And if intoxicated with cannabis, one is clumsy and your sense of time is altered. So cannabis users who actually drive uh, under cannabis, usually cannabis users, if it's just cannabis, they don't drive because they can't find their keys. So, <laughs> but <laughs> if they do drive, they attempt to compensate mm -hmm. by driving slower and staying further away from the car in front of them. The bottom line is that you shouldn't drive under the influence of cannabis impairment. Right. But studies have shown that 10% of the fatal accidents that will have, will have evidence of cannabis use, but 70 to 90 percent of those has have elevated blood levels of alcohol so that means combining alcohol and cannabis is very dangerous and that's really what contributes to those accidents and whatnot the insurance institute for highway safety looked at rates of collision claims in colorado oregon wash and washington the state yeah. after adult use cannabis was legalized. Now, this is not the medical, this is adult use, was legalized and they found a 3% increase. But a study in the American Journal of Public Health reported no increase in fatalities. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at the numbers and it's really the combination of cannabis and blood alcohol. Now, yeah. in, in reference to drug interactions, different components of cannabis are metabolized differently. So my general recommendation to patients is to medicate with your cannabis two to three hours on either side of taking any other medications and you eliminate the risk for drug interactions. Mm -hmm. I rarely see anyone take high enough doses that cannabis interacts, interacts with other drugs. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly oral doses because there uh, there are aspects or components of cannabis that are metabolized through the liver and so are often many pharmaceuticals but if you like i said give it a two or three hour uh, distance on either side of taking the medication then there's no issue uh, can, uh, I can go further, but I'll, I'll stop now because I wanted to address <laughs> some of the some of the things that Dr. Singleton said, so I could make make them clear to folks that yes, there are risks, but they really are minimal. And as far as addiction, that's right, the addiction issue I wanted to address as well. The cannabis has a low, a very low profile when it comes to addiction, and that is nine to ten percent. Uh, it's even uh, lower, cocaine is 25%, nicotine 30%. It's, uh, cannabis is the lowest addictive uh, substance we have out there. So, and the addiction is mostly psychological, it is, it is not physical. Mm. If you are on high doses of cannabis and you use high doses, yes, you can have some withdrawal uh, once you stop cannabis for sure. And, and it can be a couple of weeks of irritability, not sleeping, anxiety, the things that the, the uh, symptoms that Dr. Singleton mentioned. So yes, that's true, but it's, it's not with medical cannabis. It's with abuse of high percentage THC. Mm -hmm. That's where you'll see some of these issues. So I yeah. wanted to be really clear about that because I don't want people to use their medical cannabis thinking they're going to become addicted and have to worry about things like that. It doesn't necessarily happen. It doesn't happen with medical use. Yeah. And I just want to remind our, our listeners and viewers that in Florida, medical marijuana is legal. And for those who are interested in getting a medical marijuana uh, use card, you can go to the Florida Department of Health's Office of Medical Marijuana Use to go through the process of legally obtaining a medical marijuana use card. And you can also find the list of the nearly 3,000 physicians in the state of Florida that are qualified to recommend cannabis once you're approved for a card. And that uh, recreational adult use cannabis marijuana is illegal in Florida as right. it is at right. the state level, uh, at the federal level. And, you know, we've been hearing more about the Moore Act, which is a bill in Congress to decriminalize marijuana. So for those who are interested in that, we recommend that you go online and look at the status of that bill. 
Dr. Rowley, I want to go back to you because one of the things that I kept hearing through this entire conversation from all of you is that when it comes to self-care, people should get help with their mm -hmm. self-care, right? Mm -hmm. You know, recognize that yes, you know, do the self-assessment or look at their behaviors to determine, you know, something is off, something isn't right. I mean, because we got the pandemic, mm -hmm. we got the holidays coming up, you know, work, all of these different pressures. And, and when it comes to people of color, they don't always want to go talk to a doctor. You know, they don't want to go to a doctor. They don't think, oh, I need to go to therapy. So can you share with our listeners and viewers how do we, what's the best, the first best step, you know, when it comes to ha talking with a doctor, how should they go about that mm. in a way that they don't feel the stigma? Um, well, you know, I can't promise to eliminate a stigma for sure. Right. I mean, stigmas are deeply ingrained, right? Uh, yeah. So, you know, because even if we think about cannabis and we um, parallel, it's often parallel with marijuana, just like uh, Dr. Singleton and Dr. Wilson King were just talking about the differences and make, you know, giving some clarity on the differences in, um, in, in both of the terms and the use uh, of cannabis uh, versus um, you know, recreational marijuana, you just have deeply ingrained um, stereotypes that, um, you know, come from some very hurtful places. So, for example, with the MORE Act, um, you know, in, in looking at decriminalizing marijuana, the use of marijuana, you have to understand that many people of color were negatively impacted by uh, marijuana and, and, you know, in, in having some criminal implications. So, um, in terms of uh, trying to uh, get over the hump, I mean, you know, some people's humps are bigger than others. So, <laughs> that's one of the things that I think um, we have to assess where is, um, where, where are the negative connotations about mental health coming from? You know, as a person of color myself, you know, I'm sure I could, I could go through some of the, the things, the same isms you know what goes on in the house stays in the house mm -hmm. um you know uh just talk to god about it you know all these things that are really deeply ingrained in culture have a huge impact on on how a person views mental health um sometimes people think that if you need mental health uh, you know or you talk about mental health at all then you're crazy right you know um i have students that are going to school to be mental health counselors that are not fully convinced sometimes it takes a while for them to be fully convinced that mental health is a thing that you know they in their hearts they know that they want to help people um but they still have to go home to their families who are saying oh here you go psycho analyzing me you know we, we start using uh, the diagnosis as street terms everybody has ptsd when really you know, PTSD is a clinical term that has criteria that are specifically based um, or foundationalized in real um, traumatic oh, events, um, you know, and not just, you know, um, you, you know, I, I had a bad experience and, and, you know, now I have PTSD. So we have to break down those stereotypes through psychoeducation. Um, having con conversations that are courageous, that we can have uh, discussions and we're not offended by, um, you know, and then, you know, just really deciding for yourself whether you're going to, again, going back to that self-care definition, prioritize yourself, you know, how long um, are you going to choose to suffer? You know, it has to be a personal decision and, uh, you know, in, in wanting to, uh, we, we call it uh, the pre-contemplation stage. So is, if you can at least get to the pre-contemplation stage where you contemplate or you, you start to, you don't even have to decide that there's a problem or that you really need help, but that, you know, hey, something, something may be off. I say always look in three areas, school, community, or work. If you're hearing the same thing over and over, if you're having interpersonal issues, if you're finding that you keep having the same interpersonal issues and it's always, uh, you know, uh, the same issue and it's never you, but you, you know, you really, you're realizing. <laughs> it's like, what's the common denominator? <laughs> hey, Dr. Wilson King said it, I didn't, you know. Um, <laughs> but we really do have to start you know, that accountability piece is 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 really huge. I mean, and um, there's also, I think, more often than not now, I'm starting to see even more. And I think it has a lot to do with COVID and kind of being isolated. More yeah. people are defensive and protective of self. They don't really 
um, you know, want to take accountability for having a an issue. And so I think those barriers will begin to come down as we become um, a little bit more interactive. And so so the steps, so to answer your question, you know, the, the humps are, are, some humps are bigger than others yeah. and the steps are different uh, for, for every person in terms of uh, breaking down those barriers to even consider needing help. Yeah. And, and he, go ahead, Dr. Wilson King. In my experience with patients, the hump is generally self inflicted because if you, I hear an echo. Does anybody hear the echo? A little bit. Am I sounding okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. If if when if you go to your physician and you and the physician brings up cannabis because sometimes I'll bring up I'll mention cannabis and I'll ask a patient have you tried cannabis or have you ever thought about using cannabis and and that opens up the conversation and then I share with them how it's helped other people with some of the similar issues I'm hearing from them so they can start to feel a little more comfortable about it yeah. and then. We'll start with CBD, a CBD dominant, uh, and have them get comfortable with that. And when they start feeling relief, believe me, when a patient starts feeling relief from something they haven't been able to get relief from for a long time and have tried a lot of pharmaceuticals, when they start feeling relief with cannabis, that hump is gone mm -hmm. <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. So, so at least for them personally. Now they may not want to share all of that with other people or mm -hmm. some people want to shout it from the rooftops. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's an individual thing. And certainly there's a way a, a physician can walk you through it. There's one other um, thing I wanted to bring up in, 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 in talking about addiction and tolerance and things like that. There was a study and I was trying to think of it while I was talking and I remembered it when I stopped talking. <laughs> so there were two researchers who ranked, they actually wanted to do a study on nicotine addiction, cigarettes. Um, they ranked six commonly abused drugs in order of severity according to five criteria and that was dependence, withdrawal, reinforcement, tolerance, and intoxication. Cannabis ranked least likely to cause either serious withdrawal symptoms, dependence, and tolerance. Cannabis least likely to affect all of those when compared to alcohol, nicotine, heroin, cocaine, and caffeine. Mm -hmm. So that's how rare those symptoms are with cannabis. Cannabis tolerance can occur, but that's a physician will tell you how to avoid tolerance. It's very easy to do. Uh, there's a, a simple process. So we can avoid all of those other things. And as I did mention before, cannabis users who are males between the ages of 18 and 24 have the greatest risk of becoming addicted, but that rate still, even still, is about 10%, I mean 9%. So. You know, certain things are, are an issue and certain things really are not an issue. But as far as the hump, I do have <laughs> some patients who they're so happy that they can get their cannabis delivered so that nobody, if they go to the local dispensary, nobody will see them going in. <laughs> but they will still use their cannabis because it works and it helps them. So, yes. All right, so closing thoughts on cannabis and self-care. Dr. Singleton, closing thoughts on cannabis and self-care. Uh, definitely, I, and, and I do wanna, I wanna address the hump too as part of my closing. Um, because um, one, one of the things that um, I, I think kind of highlighted in both what Dr. Wilson King and Dr. Rowley talked about is that sometimes the symptoms that individuals experience, they experience them for so long that they feel that it's normal. And then when they get to the point and then realize, wow, this is not normal, um, then that's one of the things that's an eye opener for them. So then um, increasing awareness about the symptoms um, so that then they'll realize this is not normal. Um, mm -hmm. Also connecting them with the appropriate resources to assist them in remedying those those um, problems um, and symptoms that they're experiencing as well. And I believe also another major thing that will bring hope, um, bring um, them over that hump is hope. 
So some people feel that even though I've been experiencing this for so long, I know it's not normal, but there's no other way that I can mm -hmm. be. So, mm -hmm. but seeing that there's hope, there is a possibility for recovery, um, these steps, and then working with, you know, mental health professional, their physician, their community, their support groups, um, using their self-care plan, then we'll bring them closer and closer to that point where then they can feel that there is possibility for better than what I'm experiencing right now. Wow. So, Very good. Well, on that note, I want to thank all of you for being guests on today's Conversations on Cannabis virtual forum brought to you by the Medical Marijuana Research and Education Initiative at Florida a and University. Thank you to everyone watching this program. Tell us what you think about this forum by completing the survey that will be posted in the comments boxes on YouTube and Facebook after this live program. If you complete the survey, your name will be entered into a drawing on January 6, 2022 to win a $100 gift card provided provided by one of Mary's partners. We also want to encourage you to go to the Florida Department of Health Office of Medical Marijuana Use website to learn how to obtain a legal medical marijuana card in the state of Florida. And we also encourage you to go to Florida a and University's Mary website to learn more about this initiative, its educational programs, and additional information about cannabis use in Florida. Thanks, everybody.